Get ready to move the conversation forward. This ain't your granddad's news and comment show. This is I Doubt It Podcast with Brittany Page and Jesse Dallimore. Welcome to the show, everybody. Episode 883, can you believe it, of I Doubt It Podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Dollimore, joined today by the lovely, the talented, and indeed the scholarly, Brittany Page, everybody. Do I look like a person who just got inside after rushing the dog outside for a bathroom emergency? A bathroom emergency? You do not. Okay, that, thank you. Good. You do not. Good. It also, it's all like 100 degrees outside, too, so... You are shockingly well put together. I was also very stressed because the bathroom emergency required two poop bags. Oh, it wasn't a pee-pee emergency. And it <laughs> I only had one, so I had to run back. It was a two-tripper. It was, yes. <laughs> and we are not going to discuss these details any further. You brought it up, man. For fear of upsetting someone for talking about bathroom activities. <laughs> Sometimes people can be a little, don't talk about that. Well, people have their criticisms, so, you know, we really, what are we going to do about people and their persnickety, mm -hmm, if you will, mm -hmm. criticisms? Well, this is actually a good question that you're bringing up because it's a question we get a lot. How do we deal with the constant barrage of criticism, I would say? It is a barrage. And how do we deal with that? How do you deal with it? Or you want me to go first? Yeah, why don't you talk about how you deal with it first? <laughs> um, well, I have a weird I, I have a weird ability, I guess, to just let it flow off. Although there is every once in a while, someone will le level a criticism and I'm like, oh, well, that's valid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll address it and I'll think, and I'll, you know, thick, maybe not fixate on it, but think about it enough and then maybe implement that used to be like technical issues like with the show or how I whatever and I'd be like no most of this is completely invalid and I don't care what they say mm -hmm. but for some reason some stuff does get through that I feel is valid and I and I onboard it if you will can you remember the last time that you mm. heard a criticism and decided to onboard that criticism I don't. I wish I did. Mm. Um, if if this, this had been a planned intro topic, <laughs> you could have done some research. Yeah, I may have. I may have been able to noodle it through. I mean, it happens pretty frequently. I'm not just I'm doing everything right. Mm -hmm. But a lot of criticism that we get is easy to ignore because it's just unfounded. It's shitty. I mm -hmm. mean, oftentimes we like, especially doing this show. There are people who are sexist and misogynist against you. Mm -hmm. Like somebody left a comment saying something like, "Ditch the chick" or something, mm -hmm. and stick to the stick to the, the 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 original show. Stick to what you do. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, this is the original show. <laughs> if it weren't for this podcast and our work over the 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 past almost a decade. There would be no Dollamore Daily. There would be no YouTube show. Yes, yes. I will read that comment in a moment because it gets to my point about how I can handle criticism. Because I talked openly about my fears about doing YouTube mm -hmm. in before I started doing it with my own channel. Go subscribe. And <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you should subscribe. And part of the fear was, yeah, reading shitty comments because I saw how people treated you and I was nervous to step into that. It honestly isn't so bad. And I don't know why it doesn't, it's not something that bothers me. It's not something I hold on to. I think it's because throughout my life, I've been rather unpopular. <laughs> um, by that, I mean, I have known from a very young age that I'm not for everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's partly because I am like foul mouthed and very direct and yeah. I kind of you, you don't shirk from uh, controversy or sure. confrontation yeah, and I don't go out of my way to make people uncomfortable I'm not trying to say that yeah. I, I'm very I'm a friendly person who wants to make people comfortable but at the same time I can really get in there and mix it up if like a political debate comes up for example and I really was not popular in high school I know that's shocking <laughs> it's 
not shocking. <laughs> so I think I'm just, I don't know. I, I'm not immune to it because certainly it can bother me at times, but I'm I'm not as upset by it as I thought I would be. That's, that's what I want to get to. Yeah. So what is it that's different? Because obviously the... The hate is still there. The comments, the vitriol, the venom, the the shitty YouTube comments that are, you know, it's YouTube, so people are are terrible. Mm -hmm. Like, they don't think that we are, like, real people or something who are yeah. going to read the comment. It's like when I, when I guest host for Pac-Man. Every time I do, and it's okay. I get it. People don't, they're not into me. I'm not their thing. They, they expect David Pac-Man, a, a guest host, to be exactly like Pac-Man, I guess. Mm -hmm. There's only one David, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm not that. That's mm -hmm. not who I am. Yeah. I am this guy. Yeah. I mean, for the show, when the camera's on, it might be amped up by like 10% or something. Mm -hmm. More hand flourish and, you know, more faces or something, maybe, yeah. I guess. Yeah. But this is, like, if you're hanging out and we're having a party, this is it. This is what you get. Mm -hmm. So I, anyway, I'm going off the rails here. I, I understand I'm not for everybody, but to just write that down, like, who's this fucking guy? Blah, blah. It's just, it's uncalled for? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I. But I guess when you put yourself out there in a public way, it's to be expected, you know? And yeah. I think I try to follow the content of other people that kind of take the same approach. Like, I love Mark Marin, for example, and I listen to his podcast pretty frequently. And he's kind of the same way, where he has a particular way of doing comedy. He has a particular way of viewing the world. And it's not really a popular way. It's not like a typical way. And so he has found his audience. He has found the people who like what he does. And that's kind of just what happens. You have to find the people who do like what you do, who do think sure. that you are saying important things and who like your approach. And the people who don't like it may comment on it. Mm -hmm. And that's okay because you already know, hey, there's going to be people that don't like me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a reality of the world. But I think what helps with YouTube is th th this juxtaposition of two comments that I caught on the last episode that we did and put on YouTube. It kind of illustrates pretty perfectly. Is this one of the ones I was just referring to? Yes. Because you showed me this and I was like, eh, these people. Yeah, but this really represents what we're talking about here where you are just not going to be for everybody and yeah. you have to learn to accept that. I mean, in life, on YouTube, in a podcast, in your comedy, whatever it is, right. you are not going to be for everybody. In your friend group. Absolutely. Yeah. And you just have to accept that. Yeah, for And sure. so these comments from Steve Wilson... Ditch the girl. She wastes too much time. Talk about nothing. Stick to your original format. That's the one that you were referenced. <laughs> My original format. Ditch the girl. Ditch her. And Stephen says, Jesse, babe, listen more. Talk less when the wonderful Brittany has access to the microphone. Lay back, brother. Oh, no. You see there, right there. <laughs> that is That is advice that I'm trying to imbue into myself that's i'm trying to put that into action the, what it is it's eight years nine years almost 10 years of doing this show and doing it a certain way and having to kind of reprogram myself because mm -hmm. a lot of these people don't understand the history of the show that we when we started you weren't officially co-host you were almost like just there to give me a breather in between talking, mm -hmm. you didn't know how involved you wanted to be. Mm -hmm. And so I developed a certain, you know, some people think it's assholeish, and I am kind of an interrupter anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, but I'm dealing with it. I'm trying to make myself better. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's a balance that you have to find of, there are going to be legitimate criticisms, things that you can do well. Like someone emailed us and was mad that on the Robert P. Jones episode, when we got to the end, we didn't restate his name in the name of the book because in the, for their perspective, they had been listening for an hour. And then I, I guess we didn't restate the name in the name of the book. Yeah, I don't get that. And I'm like, well, that's actually, if that's true, it seems dumb that we didn't say the name again in the name of the book. Here's what you do if you're listening. <laughs> You look on your device, and in the title, the title of the episode, it says the hidden roots of white supremacy and a shared path forward for America, whatever the title is. <laughs> that, you just look at the, the title on the episode title. Yeah. It's right there. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think a lot of it also comes with age and just kind of knowing yourself. Like, obviously, I'm being dramatic when I say I'm unpopular. I'm I'm just trying to say that I'm not like a um <laughs> like a throwing my hair back. Ha yeah. Ha. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm. I'm not, I think, what people would want or expect me to be sometimes based on how I look. Yeah, well, let me interrupt you just for a second. I I think it's it kind of breaks down along the boss lady, no, she's a bitch. Because, like, you act in, in many ways the way I act. And people don't fucking think about it for a second when I do it. But when you do it, it's like, ugh, this is a turnoff. It's just kind of in ingrained misogyny in people. Sure. And one, another difficult aspect, I guess, is having people tell me that I look like different people. <laughs> this is, I have a running list of the people that I've been told that I look like. Like a 68 year old Debbie Reynolds. Yeah, it's very funny. I mean, and this has been a good lesson for me too, that beauty really is in the eye of the beholder, that some people think I look like Myrna Loy. Okay, that's, yeah. that's a recent one I got. I didn't, we, I had to look that up. Some people Some think silent. I look like Jenna Fisher. I mean, it's just, it's a nightmare out there. And even if it's like, you know, you tell me I look like someone that is like conventionally attractive, it still is like, I don't know. I don't really want to see it sometimes. Well, also, that can be difficult. that's not where your your value lies. Yeah, yeah. That's, you have nothing to do with that. that that's not a, you choose to be educated and and informed about the topics you are so that's yes that's compliment me on that for god, sure can you imagine if i could choose to look like margot robbie oh my god <laughs> like if you could just go to the store and choose something yeah. <laughs> i'll yeah. take margot please i don't know if i'd choose that <laughs> oh what would i choose i would I'd choose probably that. just be myself <laughs> oh I mean, i'd probably be less fat you're like manny from but i also Modern have Family. some control over that yeah i don't know yeah all right. Well, the we more love you to know, know what you think. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, you learned something. Hopefully, that was an answer to the question that we seriously get quite frequently. I think it's because people see the negativity that we get. Mm -hmm. It isn't often sent to us like an email directly. You know, it'll be on Twitter, it'll be on social media, it'll be in the comments on YouTube, but it's rare that we get it directly, sometimes in a voicemail. If I answer a troll online or even on Twitter, it's usually only because one, I'm bored. Or I just in a really bad fucking mood because it's for me it's usually very easy to ignore. Yeah. Anyway, we would love to know what you think. Uh, odd uh, jumping off point here six five seven four six four seventy six zero nine. Of course, you can email a voice memo from your smartphone or just a regular old fashioned email to I doubt it at dollamore dot com. So before we move on, we want to thank our Patreon supporters because we could not do the show without our Patreon supporters. We want to thank our new Patreon supporters, Victor DS. Victor DS. The Blue Gentleman. The Blue Gentleman. Juan A. Juan A. Jesse F. Jesse F. Not Jesse D, but not Jesse F. Jesse D. Audra R.K. Audra R.K. Thank you very much. J.O. J.O. Loretta K. Loretta K. Corey W.W. W. Corey W.W. W. Ray T. Ray T. And then we want to give a, a special shout out to Barbara M. Barbara M. Barbara M. is a current Patreon supporter, but but became an annual Oh yeah. where you get 10% off of your Patreon membership price. Now, what are the benefits of Patreon? Well, you get access to the ad-free episodes, mm -hmm. whether you listen to it through Patreon in your Spotify feed, which is now directly connected to Patreon, or if you put the RSS feed link into your podcatcher. If you had told me <laughs> 10 years ago about any of these terms, I would have said, what are you saying? <laughs> and here I am saying them every week. And you also get to do the... Uh, monthly bonus episode that we do. Yep. And we're getting ready to record another one of those for September. We did a Q&A with Patreon supporters last month. And this month we're going to be talking about non-political issues. A little bit of a surprise, meaning I haven't planned it yet. So <laughs> look out for that. We, we also do. It. We also do an end of the year gift, which every year people are waiting for and it's very fun and we've really had a good time with that. Yeah. This last year it was like a campaign style button with Sweepy, because we had just gotten Sweepy with like a, a colon 
banner with I Doubt It on it because, you know, I had cancer. Yeah. The capital behind it. It was really cool. Anyway, yeah. we, we really do enjoy the figuring out. In fact, we got to start thinking about it now, what mm-hmm. the end of the year gift is going to be this year. So. Yeah, for sure. So thank you to each and every one of our Patreon supporters. We we so appreciate you and could not do the show without you. Patreon.com slash I Doubt It podcast is where you can find out about that. Yes. So we want to get to some listener communication because that's a big part of the show, has always been a yeah. big part of the show. So shout out to Steve talking about uh, getting rid of me. Another part of the original part of the show is listener communications. We're going to keep that. Hope that's okay with, with Steve. Steve All right. can fuck straight off. No, don't start that. Yeah, he can. Don't start that. Oh, hey, we have a new drop too. I mentioned at the end of the show last week, but Marcus, longtime loyal listener Marcus suggested that we use this as a drop from a couple of shows ago. I am the worst. <laughs> I am the worst. So now we can just, I can not have to talk. I am the worst. Indeed. <laughs> I'm in the background saying indeed. indeed. I just heard it. I yeah. know. <laughs> okay. So we're going to get to some listener communication. We have an email today and this is from Erica. Dear Brittany and Jesse, my husband and I are longtime listeners and enjoy your show very much. As science people, we are big skeptics, so we appreciate your careful but hilarious analysis and perspectives. We just listened to your show wherein you read an email from Jenny, a woman who had a second trimester abortion. It was moving and powerful, and I was glad to hear it. I wanted to offer another perspective. In college in the late 1980s in Gainesville, Florida, I was a feminist activist. I took a job working at our local feminist women's health clinic, which was a 501c3 organization that provided a range of services to the community, including both first and second trimester abortion. At the time, I was still studying engineering and had no medical training. I was just a passionate liberal with a crazy 80s hairstyle and a bike with a basket. (laughs) I was into punk rock and beer and boys and being pretentious. It was college. Over the next 10 years, I gave up engineering and was inspired by the nurses and doctors with whom I worked. I got a nursing degree. But this email is about the abortion patients. My experience with, as you say, the vast majority of abortion patients is they are profoundly relieved. They are terribly distressed to be pregnant at a time in their lives when they are not ready, or if they never intended to have children, or if they had a wanted pregnancy that could not be continued for whatever reason. An abortion relieves that anxiety. I had plenty of patients who described their abortions as, quote, the best decision I ever made and, quote, a huge burden taken away. They described being able to get back to their families and school and work, get back to studying for the LSAT or MCAT. Our patients were able to continue their studies and get on to graduate school, and having an abortion allowed them to do that. They were happy and content with their decisions and continue to be. I believe a social and cultural environment that allows women to discuss their abortions without fear will be very powerful politically. Women who have had abortions are not ashamed. They just don't want to eat anyone's shit about it. A woman's right to a safe, legal, accessible, affordable abortion is akin to her right to be. It is the right to participate fully in our culture and our democracy. This is a fundamentally political issue, critical. Feel free to use my real name, my city, the word abortion, or my description of eating shit, because that's exactly what it is. Yours, Erica. Here's what I like, uh, the second to last paragraph. A woman's right to a safe, legal, accessible, affordable abortion. All of those are, it's all encompassing with what we're talking about. If any one of those falls out, it's not quite the fundamental right that it that it absolutely is because there's barriers to it. Right. Well, and this really speaks to what we talked about when we had Dr. Diana Green Foster on the show to discuss her book and study, the Turnaway Study, 10 Years, 1,000 Women, and the Consequences of Having or Being Denied an Abortion. Great episode. Fantastic guest. Yeah, it was a great episode. And one of the things that she talks about is obviously the consequences of being denied an abortion, which when you look at the data, it is substantial. I mean... A woman who is denied a wanted abortion is going to suffer all kinds of negative consequences from lingering in poverty longer to remaining in abusive relationship to decreased effect on mental health. There's so many different variables that they looked at in this study and the negative ramifications for being denied a wanted abortion are tremendous. And so when you do give someone the ability to make that decision to end an unwanted pregnancy, to have an abortion, 
it gives them power and control and they can dictate what's going to happen in their life. So naturally that's going to have positive consequences for them yeah. emotionally and otherwise. So it's always nice to hear from people who have personal lived experiences working with this population. So we, we definitely appreciate Erica reaching out. And if you're wondering, you're listening to this for the first time, you're like, huh, what is that email that she's referencing? I would go and listen to our previous episode where we read a very powerful email from another listener, Jenny. Yeah, on uh, episode 882, uh, it's very, very um, I mean, it's 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 difficult to read the personal anecdotes from people that are that are so heart wrenching, so gut wrenching, and but it it, it is important. Um, we're we're grateful when people share. We're grateful that people um, like Erica share with us their expertise, not only their experiences. Uh, all of that is is great. Um, thank you very much, Erica. We we appreciate your 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 contribution very much. If you too would like to sound off, we would encourage you to do so. Uh, the number is six five seven four six four seventy six zero nine. Of course, you can email a voice memo from your smartphone to I doubt it at dollamore.com. Let's get to some follow-up on a previous episode. I don't know if it was last episode or the episode before. We talked about the Coffee City, Texas town of with a population of 250 people, but a police force of 50. And now um, they've contacted the mayor who's now denying that they knew anything about it. Well, we got some listener feedback on this last story and they were specifically asking like where is the mayor in all of this yeah. because the report did leave a lot of questions unanswered and because there are intrepid reporters working at KHOU like Jeremy Rogalowski, I think is his name. That's uh, close. <laughs> Maybe not close enough for Jeremy, but yeah, it's close <laughs> enough for J Jesse D. <laughs> okay. So they finally got the mayor on the record. Mayor Jeff Blackstone declined our repeated requests for an on-camera interview, but he did sit down with our sister station in Tyler. The mayor concedes he was unaware of many of the issues we uncovered. My first reaction was just kind of shocked. Mayor Blackstone says he had no idea more than half of the 50 officers on the Coffee City Police Department had been suspended, demoted, terminated, or dishonorably discharged from previous law enforcement jobs, some even criminally charged. The mayor and all the current city council members took office after John J. Portillo was hired as police chief. So the mayor says they were unaware of what we uncovered on Portillo's job application, that he failed to list an active DWI charge out of Florida. I was not pleased whenever I heard the allegations because if they are true, then that's that looks really bad. So we just have to make sure that we get to the bottom of all of this. The mayor says while Chief Portillo is on a 30-day paid suspension, Coffee City will investigate the issues internally as well as hiring an independent investigation firm. The scope of that probe will include the department's warrant officers, who we found didn't even work in Coffee City, but rather stayed home in Houston on the phone trying to collect outstanding traffic fines. We weren't really fully aware of how it was operating, and that was all kind of brought to light uh, as well through this story. Going forward, the mayor says all police applications will be reviewed by the entire city council before any officer is hired. His goal? Rebuilding the reputation of his town's police force and public trust. These are allegations that we can't just turn a blind eye to. The mayor also says Coffee City is asking the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement, or TCOL, for assistance with information. That agency already has an open investigation into the department. Jeremy Rogowski, KHOU 11 Investigates. Well, we know how, <laughs> we know the history of self investigations have gone. Uh, I could tell you that a 30-day paid suspension, aka vacation, isn't really imbuing me with uh, confidence in what's going on here. Yeah, yeah. Also, what do you think the chances are that the mayor knew nothing about this? 
Well, the town's so big. I mean, how could he really know? He There's can't so, keep track of everything that's he's going so on. so many plates spinning at once with his 250 population town. I'm sure he's calling Karen Bass in Los Angeles and saying, <laughs> help me. How are you managing a city this size? I need your help. We're, they're they're on par. They're yeah. they're colleagues. Yes. Karen yes. Bass, a city of, or, 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 or even a. Uh, uh, Eric Dumshit in uh, Eric Adams in New York City. Yeah, but this is always convenient. They didn't know anything. I mean, the, the right. police chief tried to claim he didn't even know about his own record when there was an active warrant out for his arrest. So it's just, you say you don't know anything and it's just, it goes away. Th- this is the problem in policing in America. And we can move on here. But it, it is is these slaps on the wrist or paid vacations when you do something wrong. I mean, it's... Yeah. It's it's remarkable. What other job do you get to act criminally and still get paid while we're we're just looking to look into it? Come on, we it's very frustrating. Well, you're going to continue to be frustrated because we're not moving away from the criminal justice topic here. We do have another cop specific story, which is actually near us in Maryland, which is a, an exciting story. But we're going to stick to follow up here with the Fulton County Jail, because on the previous episode, we played a clip of Donald Trump complaining that he had a horrible experience in yeah. the Fulton County Jail when he never interacted with inmates. He was in there for like 10 seconds. They minimized even the, the number of staff that he came into contact with. He did not have a jail experience. Right. He had a he, white glove experience. He really may have been in there for a half hour. Yeah. I mean, he walked through it. And, and it was right a out. skeleton crew. They 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 orchestrated everyone with whom he would have contact. It wasn't, like you said, your typical inmate situation. Yeah. So it's not surprising that someone like Donald Trump, with the following that he has, with the platform that he has is instead taking the opportunity to complain about how he was treated when people continue to die at the Fulton County Jail, including another death since our last episode, a sixth death in six weeks. It's happened again. Another inmate dying in custody at the Fulton County Jail. 24-year-old Chandra Delmore died on Sunday, three days after being found unresponsive in his cell. An attorney representing his family saying in a statement, the family is devastated by this loss. They're left wondering how a healthy 24-year-old dies of cardiac arrest. We are committed to doing whatever is necessary to help his family get the answers they deserve so they can begin to grieve. Delmar was arrested on April 1st for burglary and obstruction of law enforcement charges and held on a $2,500 bond. His death continues an alarming trend at the Rice Street Jail. Since August 1st, an inmate has died every week. You can't sugarcoat it. We have a problem in our jail. Chairman Rob Pitts says this is a problem the county needs to address. The question now is what do we do about it? And their top priority is cutting down on overcrowding at the jail. That's what the board is focusing in on now. Pitts says the county is considering moving inmates out of the jail to different prisons, one in Georgia, the other in Mississippi. Which theoretically, theoretically should mean that the sheriff who is responsible for the jail, he and his deputies should be able to manage better a reduced number of inmates. Pitts says the county must also answer. Why is it overcrowded? It's overcrowded because the district attorney is not indicting, the solicitor is not doing his job to the extent that he should, and the judges, Lord knows, they are not doing their job. Chairman Pitt says it's 100 to 1,000 inmates in custody who've been waiting months to even years to be indicted, while others have quickly been processed through the jail. And you turn on TV, here come some you know, white-collar suits come down, and they go breeze in and out like it's nothing. Your loved one, local, just sitting there people are getting pissed off period so the estimate being that there's a hundred to a thousand people that haven't even been indicted yet that are sitting in the fulton county jail where six people have died in six weeks yeah but you also have just i mean people who have been charged with crimes but not convicted that are sitting in jail and they have to sit there until their case ends or if they can come up with money and so if you're poor you mean the innocent until proven guilty individuals are in jail awaiting trial right innocent at risk of death because of the ineptitude of the fulton county sheriff's department which there's no other way to look at this other than ineptitude when people are dying one after the other after the other after the other on a weekly basis something's wrong and their solution let's ship them off to mississippi yeah that sounds like it's going to work great 
Well, and another thing that happens whenever we talk about these issues is we'll get feedback like, why do I care? They're 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 probably in there for a reason. They probably did something bad. Well, the people that are sitting in that jail are at some point going to be released. And wouldn't you hope that someone being held in an environment like that is in an environment where you can maximize the rehabilitative nature of that environment? You you would hope. I, I know that when, whenever I say that, people are like, yeah, but no one's being rehabilitated there. So terrible point. Well, that's that's what we say, right? That's what we want. And so they shouldn't be being in sitting in squalor yeah. while they wait and they haven't even been convicted of the crime that they've been charged with. Yeah. I'll, listen, also, there's, there's something to be said about um, incarcerating people with dignity. These people... Everyone in that jail is not a vicious child killer or or molester. A lot of these people are, you know, robbery or shoplifting or DUI, things that don't, shouldn't incur the death penalty or risk of death. We need to be better than third world nations, developing nations and how they treat you know, the dictatorial nations. We need to be better. We need to to try to get a grasp on the thing we aspire to be, the thing we talk about being, and actually do it. There's also inevitably people there that are innocent, that of course. got caught up in a situation that they didn't intend to be in, or even that were harassed by the police yeah. and got arrested and targeted because of racism. I mean, there's all kinds of explanations, and it's it's always strange to encounter people that are like, all right, convince me why I should care about someone. Right. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> um, tough tough job. I don't know well, what to do. <laughs> for some people, it's a really heavy lift yeah. to have any empathy or compassion right. at all. <laughs> We'd love to know what you think. We'd love to know what you think, especially if you live in Fulton County and you're close to this issue. 657-464-7609. Of course, you can email a voice memo from your smartphone to idoubtit at dollamore.com. Democracy facing down pessimistic politics with realistic optimism. So this story is going viral because it's rather salacious, and the, this this Maryland police officer was filmed in the parking lot of a park, embracing a woman in front of his car, like hugging and kissing, mm-hmm. and then they get into the back seat. Then they both get into the back seat. Of his cop car. Look, look yes, the, of, <laughs> of, of the cruiser, of yeah. the the SUV cruiser. You're right; it is salacious, but it's and it's also funny, and it's the, all the things that make it be viral. But it's also very important that we talk about this because this cannot be allowed to just go on. We don't need another thirty day paid investigation suspension slash vacation for a guy who this isn't, now we're going to talk about this, this isn't his first foray into trouble. This guy is a problem. Yeah, and I would say that's the more important aspect of the story is that there's always an assumption when an officer finally reaches the point where he does something so terrible that it ends up viral in the Mm -hmm. news. And the assumption is he's done this before. Yeah. This is a pattern for this person. And I think it's it, it usually happens that we can through reporting, find out that that's true. And this is another case with this guy where, oh, weird, the cop who is using his on-duty time to get a blowjob in the backseat of his cruiser Mm -hmm. is also someone who potentially could have not been a cop in 2019 when he was investigated for beating his girlfriend's three-year-old child. We were just trying to have a good time, go to uh, play soccer. Nelson Ochoa says he was in South Lawn Park in Oxon Hill on Labor Day enjoying a game of soccer with other families when a Prince George's County police cruiser pulled up and parked. He doesn't know what made him start to record, but he did. As soon as I started recording, a car pulled up and then a young lady came out. He recorded the two appearing to embrace and kiss and then get into the back of the officer's squad car. We couldn't believe what we were seeing and then what really made us go like, wow, like this is crazy is when, like I said, when the car started rocking a little bit to the left and right, that's when we were like, wow, this is crazy. And broad daylight with kids around. He was in the car for about 35 to 40 minutes. Afterward, he says both quickly drove away in separate directions. 
Prince George's County Police released a statement on X, formerly known as Twitter, saying they were aware of the video and are investigating to determine the circumstances. They tell the I-team they have identified the officer, though they have not released his name. Multiple police sources tell me it's Francesco Marlette seen here in this picture. We reported on him back in 2016 when he was accused of beating his then-girlfriend's three-year-old son. In 2019, the father of that child told me in an exclusive interview that he was trying to keep Marlette away from his son. He would say, Daddy Francesco, which is his mom's boyfriend, hits me in my face and hits me in my stomach and he's really mean. According to the boy's medical records, the three-year-old was spanked, resulting in a head injury. The Prince George's officers who responded that day ruled it an accident. A grand jury disagreed and charged Marlette. But after agreeing to anger management, Marlette never stood trial. The charges were dropped, his record expunged, and he was back on the force. His attorney declined to comment on the case at the time. A few years later, Marlette is making news again, now, in this viral video. I woke up this morning and I had two million views already. Achoa says he hopes police will take a close look at what's going on in this video. Yeah, I'm glad I caught all of that on camera so uh, Prince George can see the type of officers they have in office, you know, working for them, supposedly protecting the community. Always record the police. I hope that guy's safe. The guy who recorded. Yeah, I mean, it, it is a little nerve-wracking for him. But uh, definitely always record the police because you yeah. never know. You might catch someone going into the back of a cruiser for 40 minutes. I said blowjob earlier. It was obviously more than that. Or maybe it wasn't. I don't know. Okay? So <laughs> you heard the story <laughs> in there. He was accused of, of beating a three-year-old child. And the cops ruled it an accident when they came up on the scene. Again, here's another instance going back to our to our follow up earlier about the Coffee City, Texas thing of cops investigating themselves. Self investigation leads to this where six years ago, if they'd gotten this guy off the force, we could have avoided this entire situation. Right. He would have been gone, would not have been a cop. Right. And so the cops ruled it an accident. The grand jury disagreed and charged him. And I also want to highlight in the medical record, they said that the child had been spanked, resulting in a head injury. I don't. Yeah. What, what does that mean? That's not. That doesn't add up. Right. That's not okay. I, I, why is that in the medical record like that? Yeah. But so the grand jury disagreed and charged him. He agreed to do anger management. <laughs> And so he, a prosecutor dropped the charges. Yeah, yeah. and then he he gets his record expunged. Would this happen to anyone who is not a cop? Right. For who, child abuse. Whose colleagues respond, whose colleagues let him off the hook. His colleagues are also complicit here. We have a, a just a, an absolute nightmare of a system where we're letting these bad apples be investigated by other bad apples leading to more bad apple behavior. Right. Come on. Yeah, so uh, very disturbing case. And I know that the the police force is talking about implementing additional standards surrounding uh, certain behaviors that will yeah. not be allowed while officers are on duty. Also, this isn't the first time where he's copping a feel. There, I saw other video of him in a parking lot where he's doing the same thing with another woman. They get in the car. It, I mean, so listen... If a guy gets away with things, he's you're just he's naturally going to push the envelope and try to get away with more and more. And if he can get away with big things, little things like a blowjob in the back seat of a car, his work car on duty seems like a a lot less risk, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Anyway, we'd love to know what you think. And by the way, this is right here. This is you know the park in Alexandria where the cobblestone streets are that we were in that time, mm -hmm. right across the Potomac River is Oxon Hill, Maryland. It's right there. Well, and also think about what would have what the consequences would have been for a couple that was yes, having sex in a, a back seat in a park where there's children. Right. I mean <laughs> you could be jail time. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so he's just violating the law out yeah. in the open and I'm really glad that it was caught on camera yes. because maybe this is finally for him, finally the thing that will allow him to have consequences that will prevent him from being a cop or 
He'll just move to another state and be a cop somewhere else. He could move to Coffee City, Texas. <laughs> Work from home. We know miles what away. they like. We know what their standards are. Yeah. We'd love to know what you think. 657-464-7609. Of course, you can email a voice memo from your smartphone to I doubt it at dollamore.com. Can we please talk about Ron DeSantis? Yes. <laughs> Well, and this is, I I think because we started the intro talking about that question we get so often about haters, I keep thinking about all the different criticism. And one of the things that's been bothering me lately is people will leave comments about, oh, it's they're talking about race again. They're talking about race again. And right. I know they're just trolls and possibly yes. just racists, but there was just a hate crime in Jacksonville, Florida, where a man gunned down three black people because they are black, because they were black, with a swastika on his gun right. and a manifesto, the whole thing. Yeah. A white supremacist. There's white supremacist Nazis marching in Florida like, out in the open. Again today. Again today they were out there above some overpass, just like they were. And your your racists are saying that we talking about racism, us talking about white nationalism, talking about white supremacy is what is driving these these attacks and driving Nazis into the street. Come on, right. that just it carries no water. It's hold nonsense, right. absolute nonsense. Well, I know you did a great video about the vi Why, the, thank you. the viral photo of the woman standing off to the side of Ron DeSantis at the press conference after the Jacksonville, Florida shooting. I think she's like an elected official. She is. Yeah. yeah. And and she was like glaring at Ron DeSantis. Angie Nixon is her name. She's a she's a state legislator. Yeah, and this this photo went viral because of the optics where Ron DeSantis is showing up to give a statement after a hate crime and this black woman is standing off to his side glaring at him yeah. just you know thinking of how he has contributed to this hate and there was another moment this week where someone at a press conference decided to directly challenge Ron DeSantis I had to get two different audio clips here so the first one is just going to be an audio clip of the man asking his question of Ron DeSantis before Ron DeSantis decides to cut him off so I'm here today because I'm one of the Americans who do not agree with all the policies. I feel that you have enacted policies that hurt people like myself, the people that I love, the men and women who are my children. You have allowed weapons to go to the street in the hands of immature, hateful people that have caused the deaths of the people who were murdered a couple weeks ago. So you have allowed weapons to fill the streets into immature, hateful people that have caused the deaths of the people who were murdered a few weeks ago. Yeah, That's the sentence where then Ron DeSantis comes in, cuts him off, rather than taking this opportunity to say something about the Nazis that are being filmed marching in the streets at Florida, uh, talking about the white supremacy problem in his state. No, he decides to go after this person asking this genuine question. Not the first. So first of all, uh, I did not allow anything with that. Well, listen, excuse me. I'm not gonna let you accuse me of committing criminal activity. I am not gonna take that. I am not gonna take that. So you, you should... You want to have a civil conversation, that's one thing. Try to say that I'm letting. That guy was Baker acting. He should have been, he should have been ruled ineligible, but they didn't involuntarily commit him. And so they were No, no, I don't no no. There is the truth. There is something about the truth. It's not everyone doesn't have their own truth. No. You don't get to come here and, and, and blame me for some madman. That is not appropriate. And I'm not going to accept it. You have, yeah. you have allowed people to hunt people like me. Oh, that is nonsense. Get, that is such nonsense. We've done more. We've done more to support law enforcement in this state than anybody in throughout the United States. Our crime rate in Florida is at a 50-year low. Uh, we have enacted... We have enacted policies so that people have a chance to live in safety. We have attracted people to come to this state in large part because we've had a commitment uh, to public safety. So the notion that somehow we're not uh, supportive of safety is absurd. 
don't have a commitment to fighting white supremacy, though. Right. And that didn't come up at all. He's also using the the bully pulpit and the microphone to blast over this guy with very legitimate questions at putting himself in a position to be the embattled governor. Right. Like, you're not... This is a constituent that you're tr you're abusing right. by not letting him just ask a simple, very easy-to-answer question. Yeah, the audio, it makes me sick because I I would have loved to have been in the audience and been shouting answer his question answer his yeah. question trying to go over the applause i it it hurts me that he didn't have any support because when you listen to that it's obvious that it was the audience was filled with Ron DeSantis supporters. Absolutely. It, that's a Trump tactic where they will start the the uproarious applause with staff, campaign staff who were certainly there to to make it seem like that people were all on board with Ron DeSantis and his message rather than in support of the questioner. When it is legitimate to talk about Ron DeSantis's policies of preventing black history from being taught in schools, ensuring that curriculum is not teaching the reality of systemic racism in this country yeah. and then you have nazis marching in the streets and hate crimes happening in your state and when you're asked about it you instead go on a diatribe about how you support law enforcement right well also he's using law enforcement dispatching law enforcement to arrest um previous felons who have their voting rights reestablished going to arrest them and then those arrests are thrown out of court all it is is intimidation and voter suppression that's being done almost exclusively to black voters in florida too so yeah. it's it sends a message to the nazis that your participation in this in this uh the political process is appreciated but if you're black we don't want you anywhere near the voting booth right well we're not moving away from Ron DeSantis yet because we have uh, kaylee mcenany Donald Trump's former press secretary and now regular on Fox News. You no, know, employee. I mean, she's she's on the payroll. She's not a contributor. She's one of their regular hosts and anchors. Yeah, that's yeah. what I was, when I said regular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you just said regular. Well, I mean regular. <laughs> I, she, she's not like a, a, a regular contributor. She's on the payroll, one of their employees. Yeah, and they had her interview Ron DeSantis, and there was a moment regarding climate change that was pretty notable. And don't worry, Jesse, I know you don't like me to find Fox News clips unless they have your favorite girl, Ainsley Earhart. Oh, yes. What about the majority? Okay, I'm the so majority. tired of protecting the minority. I always so, have that drop at the ready. Don't worry, she's here too. She won't be until the end, though. You'll just have to wait. Biden also said, when standing here in the state of Florida, nobody intelligent can deny the impact of climate crises. I study history, and they, they act like this is somehow unprecedented. It's not. This area, the Big Bend, got hit by a storm almost the exact same track in 1896 that had 125 mile per hour winds. So the idea that we've not had powerful storms until recently, that's just not factually true. And so when they, that's the first thing they want to say, you have to ask, why are you trying to politicize the weather. All right, so that's a little taste of it. And he's saying, I've studied this and I believe it because he is Ivy League trained and he is such, a, he loves to read. Yet we <laughs> <laughs> oh, Ainsley Earhart. This is a perfect I've read too many books moment from Kristen yes. Cavallari, who is anti-vax and uses her reading of books to validate her anti-vaccine position. That is hilarious. This is a go-to tactic. It really is. So talking about how he's read a lot of books, I don't care how many books Ron DeSantis has read. He, yeah, I'm sure he's read Mein Kampf. It didn't teach him about science. He's not a climate scientist. You can read books about things and you're not an expert in them because you read a book. I've read too many books. That was quick. Yeah. Look at you. <laughs> I could tell you were not listening to anything I Nothing said. Nothing you were saying. Did you hear my Mein Kampf reference? I did. Okay. Yeah. Well, so listen, Ron DeSantis may be Ivy League trained whatever that means, but he's clearly using propaganda and conservative talking points relative to climate change. No one's saying we've never had storms of this ferocity or intensity until now. They're saying the frequency with which we're having these storms is something we've never really faced before. Right. And that is a direct result of climate change, which is absolutely contributed in part by human 
interaction and interference with the climate because of fossil fuels and a number of host of other things. This isn't a black and white issue. And they're acting as though the claims on the other side are. And that's, it's propaganda and lies. Yeah. It's also frustrating, I think, just to hear someone who doesn't understand how education works, I guess. And I, I don't know if Ainsley's just playing dumb or, or, or what she's well, doing. Well, she's pretty dumb. But but I think it's obvious to most people, for example, that if you have a bachelor's degree or a master's degree or even a PhD, especially when you get to a PhD, there's a very narrow field of expertise, a very yeah, narrow yeah, yeah. subject matter that you are an expert in. And same for a master's degree. I mean, a bachelor's degree is more widespread. Your training is, is, is not as narrow. But to say that because he's read books, that makes him qualified to talk about the climate is just so absurd. Right. Well, and, it's the same thing we talked about last time with Jordan Peterson. Yes, exactly. Who, who has a PhD in clinical psychology, but now is acting like he's a, he's a jack of all trades with knowledge and expertise in all kinds, a host of different topics, which is just nonsense. Right. And and listen, people would say, okay, but you're making claims about, like you just made, the frequency of uh, Category 5 hurricanes, for example, and how that is evidence to support that the climate is changing, that there is warming of the planet that yeah. is being, um, that humans are contributing to. And they'll say, well, how do you, how do you know that? How are you qualified to talk about that? I'm well, not qualified. You understand and you follow because you're not qualified the scientific consensus. That's right. And so the scientific consensus is that the people who do have the expertise, that's their position. Well, I'm also, <laughs> he's misquoting the criticism or the, the, the accusations that people make. He's making, he's saying the wrong thing. I'm just correcting what people say. Right. Well, and he would have to misrepresent it right. in order to argue against it because right. there is no actual argument against it. That's right. And are you going to trust someone who's reading books when he won't even let kids read certain books? I mean, there's education for Ron DeSantis that is off limits. What kind of education for Ron DeSantis has been off limits? Scary thought. <laughs> so thank you, Ainsley Earhart, for that great moment. But we're not moving away from Kaylee McEnany because she's on that show where there's a lot of Fox hosts outnumbered. Mm, on the on the circle couch. Yeah, and I think it's outnumbered because... I think it's a gender thing. Yeah, there's it's women and then one man usually. Yeah. I don't think it's a viewpoint thing like it is on The Five where one of them is a liberal. I don't think so either. Yeah, so she's on outnumbered and she's talking about how the Republicans are starting to move away from identifying themselves as pro-life and starting to feel concerned about how they keep losing on abortion rights. And they're trying to figure out, like, how are we going to pivot in our language on mm. this issue? And Kaylee has a suggestion. Things that I found was really interesting that he said to the point about women not wanting to have abortions. Charlotte Lozier Institute pulled this and 70 percent of women feel that their decision is coerced. It's not a decision they wanted to make. And I spoke last night with a leader in the pro-life movement and he said to me on background, he said, Kaylee, when we poll tested this issue, the number one question that moved voters was when we said, would you support these ballot initiatives if it allowed men to coerce women to have abortions because they're financially independent on those men? It moved numbers. People had compassion on the issue. So we've got to change the way we talk about this. And I think that was a good start. That's right. I think obviously framing matters, narrative matters, especially when you're combating the left, which has such a sort of arsenal and, and a surgical dagger way of, of distorting and perverting how people feel about the pro-life movement. What I appreciate. I love that. I love that. Especially when the left has the... The, the moral weight of the argument on their side. Yeah, that was like a lot of words. You could have just said facts. I don't. Right. Well, you know, the, the right is correct about this. The left is correct about this issue. Right. So uh, w w what are we going to do? Oh, well, let's change how we talk about it in a weird manipulative way. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> They're accurately representing the pro-life movement, which is turning people off. Right. So we need to pivot and use different language that's really confusing and like a completely different question that, that was originally proposed in order to get what we're trying to get to. It was a whole lot of words that didn't need to be said mm -hmm. on the part of Kaylee McEnany. Yeah, so just be aware that this is kind of where the Republicans are headed now on this issue because they see the writing on the wall. They see that 
revoking abortion access, abortion rights, eliminating abortion rights in this country is unpopular yeah. and that they're going to lose. And they they are starting to talk about how people view the term pro-life as being a, against abortion all the time in any situation. And they want to start moving away from that and pretending they're more flexible. Well, I mean, I think it's they see the writing on the wall even now. They're not moving away from their position. They just want to re-explain what the position is or talk about it in different terms. But people understand in a wide swath of America are understanding that it is not the pro-life movement. It's the forced birth movement. If they were pro-life, they would try to support these babies they're forcing to be born with social programs. But they're not about life, and people get it. Right, and I saw NBC reporting that quoted a Republican who said they do want to start talking about pro-baby policies. Right. And the pro-baby policies are everything that Republicans are against. I mean, they throw fits about feeding kids free school lunch. Yeah. What 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 pro-baby policies do you want to support? Right. Well, we'd love to know what you think about this. Uh, 657-464-7609. You can always uh, email a voice memo from your smartphone to idoubtit at dollamore.com. So we're going to jump back to uh, a topic we talked about a little bit where people are starting to complain like that we talk about race a lot. And the reason that we talk about race a lot is not only because of the hate crime that recently happened in Florida. And that continue to happen constantly seemingly on a, on a monthly or every other month basis. There's a horrific crime that's predicated because of the color of someone's skin in 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 wherever they are, whether that be a a shopping center, you know, a Walmart or whatever in Buffalo, a Walmart in El Paso, or a Dollar General in in Jacksonville. Right, and people will try to make the argument, well, this is going to be naturally solved through attrition. And I came across a story this week that I haven't seen widely reported. And it makes a good case that attrition is not going to solve our problem. That is the old generation dying off. It is not just old people who are racist. Racist kids also exist. And that is the case in this story where there was an attempted murder on a 14-year-old in Massachusetts. Details have been released about an alleged racist murder attempt at a pond in Chatham. 14-year-old John Sheeran was indicted by a grand jury and charges of attempted murder and assault with a dangerous weapon. Sheeran is one of two white teenagers that allegedly targeted a black juvenile in July. Two witnesses say they saw Sheeran pushing the victim underwater, knowing that he needed a life jacket to swim. They also say that a second white juvenile was laughing and called the victim George Floyd. The victim also alleged stone throwing and being called racial slurs. Sheeran is being held without bail and is due back in court on September 13th. Now, I understand when people make the argument about attrition that these people are going to die off and we'll be left with a more um, understanding electorate or, you know, population. The problem with that is, is that we have people like Nick Fuentes, who are a younger generation, a Generation Z or whatever they're called now, who are leading this type of hate into the future from a young generation's perspective. And it's it's dangerous, and they're capitalizing on it, and it's, it's, it's hate, it's violence. It is maybe even a more pernicious um, because of the fact that... Uh, they are really, truly calling for autocratic governments, a king. Donald Trump is the king. They're they're using language that up to this point has not been acceptable by really anybody. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to continue to talk about race. We're going to continue to get people complaining that we're talking about race. But this is why we're talking about race. I mean, you might you might notice if you're Steve, you might not notice that on this show, <laughs> we, that lady up. we talk a lot about injustice and yeah. how we can move toward a more just and equitable society. And I mean, when you have teens that are trying to drown black kids in Massachusetts, laughing and calling them George Floyd. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this isn't even a story that is mainstream. I mean, have you heard about no, this story? No, no, this is the first time. Yeah, so 
I mean, it was an NBC News clip, but like it's not wall to wall. They're talking about CNN's polling wall to wall, but right. they're not talking about this wall to wall. So there's certain choices that are made in reporting, and we make those choices too to highlight what is important, and this is important. That's I was gonna. I'm glad you said that. It, it teed me up to say this that it, we're gonna use this our our platform and our little tiny corner of the internet in a responsible way, and it's bringing stories like this to light so people don't fall into some slumber uh, being comfortable that racism is behind us. Once Donald Trump is no longer president, uh, we'll be back to normal when normal is racism. Normal is uh, attacks on black people and normal is white supremacy. And that is what we need to do. And we're gonna use this platform, whether Steve fucking likes it or not, to talk about these issues. Right. So. On the topic of Biden's polling, there's a lot of conversation about- Can we, very briefly, can we talk about what you just mentioned with the CNN thing? Yesterday, wall to wall, Thursday was wall to wall. All CNN talked about was this particular poll that had Nikki Haley doing better against Biden. By the way, all within the margin of error. Mm -hmm. So it, it wasn't some bombshell reporting they were doing. And they just ran with it all day to try to tee up, uh, um, leaving people in doubt about the efficacy or the 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 how well Biden would do in a in a twenty twenty four matchup against any Republican. Yeah, it's just stupid. Well, it's been constant about his age too. If you're watching CNN, you are inevitably hearing a lot about how there's a lot of concern over Biden's age, even though. His the top contender for the Republican nomination is like three or four years younger yeah, than they him. They went to high school together. So, <laughs> and there's not concern about that, but they don't seem to spend a lot of time asking why the Democratic Party will admit, yeah, we would prefer someone who's younger and we're bummed out about how old Biden is. But the Republican Party is like, no, it's whatever Trump says. It's right. Donald Trump. <laughs> so, Gavin Newsom. Donald Trump, baby. <laughs> That's a little slow. I was, I was trying to do it I know, I myself. Know. So Gavin Newsom has been talked about, like, is he running? Is he going to challenge Biden? Because he challenged Ron DeSantis to a debate. He loves to mix it up. He's pretty popular. So there's been a lot of conversation. Is he going to challenge Biden? What does that look like? Well, he sat down with Chuck Todd, and he finally answered this question once and for all. Filing deadlines haven't passed. President Biden doesn't run. Why shouldn't we consider you a likely well, I think the vice president is naturally the one lined up and the filing deadlines are quickly coming to pass. And I think we need to move past this notion that he's not going to run. President Biden is going to run uh, and we're looking forward to getting him reelected. Uh, I think there's been so much wallowing uh, in the last few months and hammering even in this respect. Uh, but we're gearing up for the campaign. We're looking forward to it. I, I under, you know, but. You hear these calls privately. What do you tell these donors who are wallowing in this? Uh, time to move on. Let's go. And am I supposed to interpret that comment about the vice president that if for some reason the president chose not to run at this point, well, that's the next, everybody rallies that, around her? The, it's the Biden-Harris administration. That's a, maybe I'm a little old-fashioned. Yeah, maybe, little, maybe I'm a little old-fashioned about well, you know, presidents and vice presidents. I was a lieutenant governor, so I'm a little subjective. It's your relationship with the vice president. Uh, we knew each other before we were both in politics. Today I got sworn in as mayor, walked across the street. She got sworn in as district attorney. Uh, extraordinarily close working relationship, including her time in the Senate. So you can't um, imagine ever here. having to run against each other. Of course not. By definition, it won't happen. Uh, but we've I've said that a thousand times. Uh, we privately uh, continue to maintain a very good relationship, interpersonal, just how you doing, checking mm -hmm. in. Uh, it's been a challenging few years with COVID. Uh, and uh, we've had the opportunity to sit down and have lunch together yeah. in the White House. We spend time uh, talking about important so things. So nobody's and upset. Things. She's not upset that you're going to debate Ron DeSantis? Uh, maybe. I, apparently, someone in uh, her office is, because uh, I read some off the record quotes. Uh, I wish I knew who that was, uh, but I don't hear it from her. So, and I'm certainly not hearing it from the White House itself. Hmm. Seems like some drama's going on there. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. someone's unhappy that he's challenging Ron DeSantis to debate, but it's yeah, yeah, not yeah. Kamala Harris. Sure. It's right. just well, someone in her office. Well, let me say, <laughs> let me say, I didn't think Kamala Harris was ready when, during the primaries <clears throat> for the 2016 election. Uh, I don't think she's ready now. She just got, it's like Mike Pence. I'm not comparing her to Mike Pence, only that 
Mike Pence wouldn't be where he is unless Donald Trump picked him to be the VP. The people resoundingly said, Kamala Harris isn't for us. We don't want her to be the president. But now she's in a position to maybe be the president only because Joe Biden picked her and she's on the ticket. Um, I don't necessarily care for her. Um, I think she she's not progressive enough for me. Absolutely. Um, I also have criticism for, for uh, Gavin Newsom. But I think as a leader and as a governor, as an actual elected official, he's been very effective. He bummed me out during COVID, like kind of a, this these rules are for you, these restrictions are for you, but they're not for me. I'm going to have large group dinners at restaurants where we're all unmasked. That, at French Laundry, right? Yeah, that bummed me out a lot, a lot. But that's really the only criticism I have. Well, and he married Kimberly Guilfoyle. I mean, <laughs> other than that... Yeah, I don't know. But, you know, it's good that he's kind of laying the, the marker down and saying, I'm not running. We need to get behind Joe Biden because at this point, he is the nominee. He is the choice. And we need to set aside all the rancor, set aside all of the nonsense and the uncertainty and get behind the guy who's going to run against the fascist Republicans. Yeah. I do think in interviews that I've seen with Kamala Harris that the the Biden administration, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, other figures in that administration need to stop behaving as though they're the heir apparent and that this yeah. is just something that they deserve because Donald Trump is so terrible that it's so obvious that that like it's just obvious. Why wouldn't anyone vote yeah. for us? Yeah. You really got to continue to sell it. You got to talk about how important it is. You got to talk about the fascism. You got to talk about what you have done. Yeah. And how that has impacted Americans. With details. Yes, details. Go into detail. And not like a fake detail. Like I met Peggy down at the Iowa State Fair and right. she told me how it was so great. No, like <laughs> actual numbers and, yes. and meaningful differences that you've made. The impact. Because there there are metrics to look on, to lean on. Absolutely. They have done good things. Have they done enough? No, because we have Kirsten, Kirsten Cinema and Joe fucking Manchin yes. and Republicans who are obstructing at every moment. But the things that have been accomplished, in spite of all of the resistance, have been good. And that's what they also need to say. Enough with my pal across the aisle, yes. Mitch McConnell, after he froze up, he's doing great. He's we really, honorable. Yeah, no, he's not. And we need to stop doing that yeah. because they're getting in the way. And they're getting in the way of what the Biden administration wants to accomplish. End of story. That's yeah. what they need to do. So they need to go hard time to stop palling around with the Republicans and really lean in if we're actually going to like not be a fascist country. It's also time to not not pile around, but you can pile around with us by becoming a Patreon supporter as I wrap up the show in grand fashion. <laughs> How good was that? Patreon.com slash I Doubt It podcast is where you can go pick your tier, see if you're interested. We would encourage you and invite you to become a member of the Patreon family. Uh, we talked about at the beginning of the show. We love you guys. We appreciate you very much. We would invite your uh, participation in this conversation. Part of the mission of this show is moving the conversation forward on an episode-by-episode -episode basis, and you can do that by leaving us a voicemail or an email. You can call and leave us a brief voicemail at 657-464-7609, or, of course, email. I doubt it at dollamore.com. We love you guys. We appreciate you very much. And we will see you next time. For Brittany Page, I'm Jesse Dollimore, and this has been I Doubt.